lines, lines are the worst. I don't think any of us are fond of waiting in line. We will look for the shortest line we can find at the grocery store checkout. And if you've ever been to a really big amusement park, every good ride has a really long system of what I call cattle stalls so that you can wind through an endless line before you get on that ride. And how often, after the fact, do we lament that we stood in line for two hours for a two-minute thrill ride? And I realize that some of the amusement parks you might have been to in your life Two hours might be optimistic. And and I think we all understand that lines are a part of human existence. Though now a lot of people, for that very reason, order everything on the internet and let things be delivered to their home so they can avoid that line. Sometimes, even online, so many people are trying to buy something like especially concert tickets, say you have to wait in a virtual line. Because now lines have entered the digital age. And let's face it, how often, for how many of us, woe be unto thee if thou shouldst cut in front of me in a line. Right? Because we will go Old Testament on you. So, how long were the lines to get to Jesus? When there were entire towns, and then eventually cities, coming out not just to talk or to listen, but hoping for a touch, hoping for a healing, hoping for a personal conversation, the lines had to be so very long. So often, people will say Nicodemus in John chapter 3 came to see Jesus at night because he didn't want anyone to know that he was talking to Jesus. What is the chance, though, that that was the only way he could get to Jesus at a time where he could have a one-on-one conversation? How many times during all those festivals in Jerusalem had people had to stand in line at the temple, waiting to get the right coin for an offering, waiting to have their sacrifice evaluated to see if it was perfect enough, waiting for their turn with the priest. How much waiting just to have their little opportunity to seek God. And in the midst of sadness, in John chapter 15, Jesus introduces a hope that when they were hearing it, the disciples didn't even fully get it yet. But it simply meant no more waiting in line to be with Jesus. No more standing in line to connect with God. And we're going to look at John chapter 15, verses 26 through 27. Then we're going to jump to 16 and begin with the latter part of verse 4. And move into verse 15. It's going to be on the screen if you want to follow along. Jesus taught them. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. 
about sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. We heard it earlier as Ryan read from the book of Acts. We so often just let Luke's description of events take over on Pentecost Sunday. And Luke does powerfully describe a group of believers prayerfully seeking until they are filled up with God's Spirit, who then leads them out into the crowd to share their experience and their understanding of Jesus. And they do it so incredibly that that day, in that movement of the Spirit, it brings the church itself into existence. The entire book of Acts that follows is about God's ongoing leadership of the early church through the presence of the Holy Spirit. John just gives us something a little more personal, a focus not so much on the empowerment for mission aspect of the Holy Spirit, but rather in the hope-giving, comfort-bringing presence of a friend that his disciples feared that they were about to lose. That's really the context of everything Jesus says to them here. He tells them he is going away, and all they have in response is fear. Sadness, this sense of impending loss. They are getting an early emotional start on his departure, which isn't even there yet. And it is in John's writing alone that we find this unique little word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit. In Greek, the parakletos. We often will just transliterate it as the paraclete. It can be translated as the advocate, the comforter, the helper, the counselor. And then there's the most literal translation, the one called alongside. Oddly enough, it is the word in Greek if you are being questioned by the police and you say, I want my attorney, I want my parakletos. And in this promise that Jesus makes to them, there is the end of waiting in line. If time spent with Jesus was precious, this is Jesus promising somehow to be right there with each of them as he can be to each of us. And as Jesus says in John 14, 17, this is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. This is Jesus being so close through the spirit that he will live with us and he will live within us. No more lines. And there was an old song that went, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. That was really profound, biblical and theological truth. Jesus couldn't physically walk with each one of his disciples all at the same time. And his departure then wasn't them losing what time they got with him as they had to share him with each other and all these crowds of people who wanted his time. This was them gaining unlimited access. Jesus walking with each of them all of the time. The message of Jesus will have the Spirit helping us to be reminded of his words. And across two millennia, we see the Spirit just being there, helping us to learn to correctly apply Jesus' words to a changing world. This doesn't mean that Jesus' teaching changes, but we change as we learn how 
to speak Jesus to a different world. When to speak Jesus. Maybe even where to speak Jesus. The Spirit even helping us understand how Jesus' words must come alive in new ways for each new generation. When Jesus says the Spirit of truth will testify on his behalf, that all comes together as the way that the Holy Spirit assures us of who Jesus is and assures us that he is present in our hearts to change our lives. The truth of Jesus becomes real to us. As the song says, he tells me I am his own. He speaks assurance to my heart. There is a revelation of what we call the Trinity here. Somehow, it is the Father's will that the Spirit comes to us, but the Son's direction of the Spirit to us. And the Spirit then becomes the Father and the Son's expression beside us and within us. Jesus died to remove the barriers between us and God, and now he lives to bring God to us and keep God near us. There are no lines. Jesus says that the Spirit has a theological purpose, confronting the world on issues of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But those words in this passage aren't defined as we might tend to if we just pulled those words out. Sin here is not a checklist of rules, but a refusal to believe in Jesus. Righteousness is found here somehow in the relationship between the Father and Son, a relationship that must be mirrored in our love for God and for each other. And judgment not pointed toward us, but toward the world and the selfish values that rule over it. We read those words, Jesus says, he will declare to you the things that are to come. And so often, so many people are tended to read scripture always looking for a way to tell the future. And that even turns itself into kind of a trap. It makes a lot more sense to understand this as the Spirit helping us to understand that whatever the future may bring, the Spirit will bring us understanding of how God's Word will speak to it. So that the Bible is not an old dead book like some would claim, but through the Holy Spirit, the Bible is a living book. And through the Holy Spirit's help, we are able to address a changing world with all the cultural and scientific and technological changes that that brings. Because the Spirit helps us when we need help most to speak the Father's love through the Son's teaching to the world's situation. Amen. Jesus said that he has a lot for his disciples to hear that they could not bear. Literally, that they weren't supposed to take up yet or to carry yet. Because those times had not yet come. Jesus, though, through the Spirit, would give what was needed when it was needed. And this is a good way to understand how the writer of Hebrews says that God's Word is living and active. Through the Holy Spirit, the written Word of Scripture and the living Word, who is Jesus, are able to guide us through life, even when that life is so very different from the lives that were lived 2,000 years ago. In a way, I guess we could say that sometimes people want to use Scripture in a way that tries to keep change from ever happening. Jesus points us here towards something completely different. He says that no matter how much the world changes, no matter how much life changes, He will be there through the Spirit's presence beside us, inside of us, to help us speak good news to the moments in which we live. So we don't fear the present and we do not have to fear the future. Our Jesus is still speaking actively within us today. And he will speak with just as much love and understanding to tomorrow. The sin, the missing of the target is to not believe that he is still here and not to believe that he is still speaking. It is Pentecost Sunday. We need to believe that Jesus is with us, that he still speaks to us. And maybe most of all, we need to realize that in our world, in our time, in our situation, he really does know exactly what we need to hear. We just need to be willing to listen and to believe. Would you pray with me? God, we sing, we pray that your spirit would move, that your spirit would work. 
God, when we asked you into our lives, you sent your spirit within us. The Father's will, the Son's direction, the Spirit's presence. But God, sometimes we are slow to learn to listen. We forget that we are in a relationship with you and in a relationship there is speaking and there is listening. And maybe sometimes we're tempted to do all the talking. God, help us to seek you. Help us to be open to you and help us to learn to listen to you, to hear you, to have hearts that are guided by you. That as you guide our hearts, we will live it through our lives. So help us to believe that you are still God, you are still present, you are still moving and working, and you still have things to say to us, within us, and through us. It is Pentecost. Help us to seek a fresh experience of that for ourselves. Help us to seek to listen each day. Help us to grow in our experience of your spirit. And God, we dare to ask today that you would do whatever you have to do, whatever you need to do this week to get through to us, to awaken us and teach us how to listen more and to hear clearly. And we've prayed for someone who lost their hearing this week. Maybe we're in tempted in, in, in danger of being tempted every day to lose our hearing toward you. Help us to hear. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to end with a couple of verses from Romans 8 and make it our blessing for this week. These are the words of Paul. They'll be on the screen. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes seeds with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind or what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. To make that our blessing for this week. May you know the peace that is found in the heart assurance that your future, both in the unexpected things of each day and in the eternity that lies ahead, rests fully in the one who gave himself for you. May you find that in those times when you don't even know how to pray, the Spirit of God always hears and understands the wordless cries of your brokenness and takes your deepest needs to the Father. Finally, may you trust that God has sent the Holy Spirit into your heart because he truly desires to connect to the depths of who you truly are. Thank you. You're dismissed.